Okay, well, I think that we're going to go ahead and get started. Good, good afternoon in some places. I'm Maria Monroe DeVita, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Washington. I'm also a trainer and consultant on evidence based practices, including assertive community treatment for the Northwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, or MHTDC. Welcome to today's webinar, The Role of the Peer Within a Clinical Team with Dr. Pat Deegan. We're grateful so many of you were able to join us and to learn more about this important topic. Um, we're going to shift over to our land acknowledgement here. Uh, we just wanted to take a time, the time to acknowledge the land and pay respect to the indigenous nations whose homelands were forcibly taken over and inhabited. This calls us to commit to forever learn how to be better stewards of these lands through action, advocacy, support, and education. We will put in the chat a fantastic resource from Native Land to learn more about this. Next, I'd like to shift to uh, orienting all of you to the MHTTC network. Uh, you can see a map of it here. The MHTTC network is supported by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA. It includes 10 regional centers, a National American Indian and Alaska Native Center, a National Hispanic and Latino Center, and a network coordinating office. The MHCDC network supports resource development and dissemination, training and technical assistance, and workforce development for the mental health field. Our Northwest MHTTC covers HHS Region 10, which includes Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. And a little bit more about our particular MHTDC is on this slide here. So as you can see, our goals are to accelerate the adoption and implementation of mental health related EVPs, heighten awareness, knowledge, and skills of the workforce, foster alliances, and address tra training needs among diverse partners, and ensure availability and delivery of free publicly available training and technical assistance. On the right uh, there, you can see some of the resources that we provide, and on the left are kind of the core part of what we do, including free, free training and technical assistance, self-paced online courses, live events like this webinar, which will then be posted for um, asynchronous learning in the future, and then virtual learning communities. And to find out more about us, you can see our website below as well. All right, I wanted to just briefly say something about an upcoming three-part series. We're really excited to announce um, the new series, Increasing Cultural Connection with Hispanic and Latinx Clients in partnership with our National Hispanic and Latino MHTDC. We'll go ahead and put a link in the chat to learn more, and we're really grateful to, to, to bring that additional content to you in the future. Um, also, a word about language. It's our intention to always be mindful of using language that supports recovery. This slide was created by our network to uphold these values clearly, including using person-first language in your chats and questions. We'll also continue to reinforce that in the way that we interact with all of you. And just quick housekeeping, um, as you'll note, all attendees are muted and off camera. Um, we'll post uh, the recording and slides later on our website. Um, so you'll get information about that since you've already registered. And then we'll ins uh, send instructions on how to obtain a certificate of attendance in a few weeks. Also, please note we've got the chat function and the Q&A function. So um, many of you already introduced yourselves in the chat. Sometimes we'll periodically ask people to comment on something, or if you have a general comment, feel free to put that in the chat. Um, the key here is that if you've got a question, put that in the Q&A box, and that helps us to track which questions have been asked and which ones have been answered. So if you want a response, that's the place to do it. Um, the only time that um, a different kind of response might be needed is if you um, have some technical assistance. And if, with that, you can just put into the chat to our panelists and, and hosts uh, if you need any help with uh, technical assistance challenges um, with technology, and we can help you with that in the chat. All right, at the very end, we're going to put a link to the evaluation just to note that this is a requirement of our SAMHSA uh, grant and also something that we really take seriously in terms of getting feedback from you all and helping to guide the work that we do in the future. Um, we really take, take to heart uh, your comments and, and suggestions for future um, events like this. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Patricia Deegan. Pat Deegan's mission is to help at, activate and empower mental health services users in their own recovery 
and to provide peer supporters and clinicians with the know-how to support people in their recovery journey. She is uniquely positioned to fulfill her vocation because she was diagnosed with schizophrenia as a teenager, went on to get her doctorate in clinical psychology, and today leads a company run by and for people in recovery. She is a thought leader in the field of mental health recovery, has numerous peer-reviewed publications, and has held a number of academic appointments, and has carried a message of hope for recovery to audiences around the world. And so with that, um, I would like to start today with a conversation with Pat Deacon. I'm going to go ahead and start that now. Um, Pat, it's great to have you here with us today. I'd just like to get us started with um, this notion of conspiracy of hope. It's a phrase that appears in your online presence and on social media, and just love to hear you expand a bit on what this means for you and in your work. Yeah, sure. So conspiracy of hope actually refers to a specific paper that I uh, wrote, I think, way, way back in 1988. And uh, it seems like ancient history now, but I think it's as real and as relevant as ever before. And um, uh, basically the idea of a conspiracy of hope um, was to say that, look, if, if we plant a seed in a desert and it fails to grow, do we ask what's wrong with the seed? <laughs> or do we take a look at the environment around the seed? And we ask what needs to change in this environment so that this uh, seed can thrive, not just grow, but even thrive. So Conspiracy of Hope was a call to stop blaming poor outcomes in mental health services on the fact that people were so sick and instead start saying, if we're not getting the outcomes that we were hoping for, if people are caught in systems where they're living out their entire lives, then there's probably something wrong with the environments in which we're asking them to grow. And so the conspiracy of hope became a sort of a clarion call to the community of both providers and family members and individuals to say, hey, um, let's conspire together the word conspire, conspiracy comes from the Latin uh, to breathe the spirit with, to breathe the same spirit. So what is the spirit that I was calling people to breathe with me, to, to uh, give voice to? And it really was a spirit of hope. And what would it mean to create hope-filled environments in which um, people um, it was palpable, the feeling that um, I can have the life I want, I can get there. And there's a network of co-conspirators who are with me in helping me uh, achieve the life that I want to live and to move beyond sort of that um, horizon of, oh, mental patients just live out their lives in the landscape of the human services. And I think to some degree, the good news uh, is that we've begun to move the needle a bit on that. I think we still have a ways to go. I think that, that um, uh, we uh, now have uh, supportive employment programs and we are developing and cultivating expectations that people can and will work if provided the opportunity and the supports. Um, we have uh, fewer institutional beds, although we do have trans institutionalization in prison, which of course remains terribly problematic. Uh, but we have more people um, living uh, in communities of their choice. And these are all really important new environments. Um, uh, we're seeing less lifelong institutionalization, at least within um, psychiatric uh, facilities. It's still there, but it's, it's um, not completely gone away, but certainly not on the grand scale that you might have seen in the, in the 80s when I was coming up. So yeah, these, th th that's really what I mean by a, a conspiracy of hope. And, 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 and in my work, what I've done is notice that, gee, mental health professionals are, are basically good-hearted people who are there for their own very personal reasons, but they, um, they, they're they there on a mission themselves. And that, um, but really 
um, when it comes to um, supporting people, not maintaining them, not stabilizing them. That's what everyone was trained to do. But no, let's help people recover for maintenance, stabilization. That's a low bar. Let's help people get the life they want. That they needed mental health professionals and eventually the peer workforce. We need new tools that sort of um, embody or that uh, capture uh, recovery oriented practice. And uh, so, really, what my company is about is we've dedicated ourselves to developing tools and technology, whether it's the Common Ground software program that's used uh, in psychiatric care clinics so that people can have a voice and a choice in deciding about medication. Imagine that. <laughs> Imagine rather than being told what to do, we actually did share decision-making with people. Imagine a software program that works like an assistive technology to help people uh, speak up and be heard. So uh, we do every, everything we do is about helping people get a voice and a choice um, and to bring their voice to the very center of the care team. Because I think that ultimately that's where the real co-creation of health can occur. It's, healthcare is not something we deliver and put on people. Healthcare involves a partnership, right? And when we meet with mental health professionals, there are two experts in the room. And that professional may be an expert, say, in social work, okay? But I'm an expert in me <laughs> and what matters to me in my life. And it's only by pairing a recovery partner with a professional that we're able to begin to uh, discern the pathway into the life I want for myself, which is the recovery journey. So it's a very important idea, this conspiracy of hope, I think. And I think it's as real today as it, as it ever was. Absolutely. I love that. I had no idea. It's fantastic. And I think too, it's this sort of promotes this idea that we all have a role to play. Um, it's not, it's not on the one person in this idea of other people, not probably just mental health professionals themselves, but also just, as you said, there are co-conspirators kind of across, you know, their communities. So you know, family members, social supports, you know, personal supports, those kinds of, of folks in their lives. That's a real community of support. Yeah. It's a village. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, speaking of um, other providers or um, a particular kind of provider, could you kind of say a little bit about, you know, what you would say to people out there doing peer work and um, those who might be contemplating kind of becoming a peer or anything you want to say kind of related to that particular type of role? Well, I think a lot of my talk today is really, really going to focus on, you know, what is this peer role? But what I have to say to my colleagues who are, um, you know, peers, uh, peer supporters working in the mental and behavioral health space, I, I, I think that it's critical that we remain peer, that there is a very real kind of drift that's going on out there. And it's not just in the United States, it's all around um, uh, the world. And I think the danger is that we'll lose what makes our practice that makes us uniquely peer and simply become junior case managers, junior clinicians. And that's a tragedy, right? And that because that then, then all that happens is we're, we're low paid junior case workers who are propping up a system that's broken. We don't want to go there, right? What we want to do is to remain truly peer. But we can't do that completely alone, especially if we're working on clinical teams. It's another thing to do peer work out of a peer center. Okay, that, that's, a, that's a, to me a very different kind of role. But to do peer work within a traditional mental health uh, uh, program of sorts or a clinical program or a first episode psychosis team, whatever, an ACT team, the danger is we just drift on, on over and become an underpaid junior clinician. And, um, and so that's really in part what this webinar is all about, really starting to focus on that. And, and, uh, and importantly, we can't do it alone. If, if, if we're working embedded in traditional mental health services where our person in the next office, person in the next room is a social worker and another one is a psychiatrist, you know, we have got to um, include the psychiatrist, the social worker, the team leader, et cetera, in understanding this unique role and actively supporting it and not working against us. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, so, so, so staying true 
to what makes us peer is the, is the ticket as far as I'm concerned. Um, at the same time, you know, knowing that we're working as colleagues with traditional professionals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a balancing act. Mm -hmm. Great to hear that. I appreciate you taking some time for some conversation. Thanks, Dan, Pat. It was a pleasure, Mary. I think now we'll go ahead and shift into your webinar. So feel free to, to go ahead and share your screen and I'll uh, meet myself and keep an eye on the questions. Absolutely. Okay, I, I just wanna start by saying I'm nervous. I, uh, I can't see you guys, but I do believe you're there. And <laughs> I see you chirping in the chat. So that's always a good thing. Um, and uh, uh, I've been away for two weeks. I, 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 my partner, Deborah, and I went to St. Croix, first time pretty much out of the house since the pandemic began. But we, we took the risk and we went and we just got home. And so you're my first group of folks that I'm talking with since I'm back. So I'm hoping my motor mouth can motor through this and do okay. We're um, honored. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, but let me start by saying what I... Um, really feel strongly about, and, and that is that I know that the work that you are doing, each of you, uh, day in and day out, is um, very, very important. And I don't think we hear this enough, and so let me begin by thanking you. Um, I know that uh, we're not in it for the money, uh, and that there are far easier ways to make a living than um, working with people um, as they're rebirthing themselves, right? It's a beautiful, beautiful vocation. We get to practice what I like to call, and Lily Tomlin does too, aerobics, right? Not aerobics, right? But aerobics, the, to be privileged to be able to be with individuals through some of their toughest and darkest days and being able to support them as they are uh, rebirthing um, their lives and transforming into who they're going to become. And of course, the work is never about helping people get normal. Normalcy is profoundly overrated. <laughs> the task is to help each and every individual become the unique, never to be repeated gift that they are. And that that's a great honor. Uh, that uh, uh, that we have in doing our work. And I don't think we hear often enough, um, thank you, and that um, uh, so many of you took such risks being out there during a global pandemic, right? Um, and yet this uh, love that we have for our fellow peers and for the people that we're working with just transcends uh, personal uh, fear. And so um, again, thank you. And on that note, let me um, begin to share my screen um, and share with you um, what I've prepared for uh, today. So our topic today is what exactly does a peer specialist do on a clinical team? Um, and the answer is not provide peer support <laughs> because I mean, of course that's a high level answer but it's very vague, right? So we wanna, we wanna drill down into this and um, uh, ask, uh, ask this question, what exactly, whether it's a PACT team, an ACT team, uh, uh, whether it's a traditional program like a rehabilitation program, or if, if we're peers working on an inpatient unit, or if we're working on a um, first episode psychosis coordinated specialty care team, you know, uh, or just a big mental health center, what exactly do peer specialists do? And as I said, I get concerned because I think there's a fair amount of confusion out there about what it is we do. And uh, so I'm hoping to clear some of that up uh, in this uh, webinar today. So let me start um, at the beginning and say that in my opinion, um, the most basic definition of peer support is that it's love freely given. Uh, I think that any of us who come into the work of being a peer specialist, a peer supporter, are people who've had our own personal experience of peer support well before we knew it was a title, before we even knew what it was called. That um, I like to think about what was my first time I was really exposed to what I later would learn was peer support. And for me, it was always about <clears throat> when I would go into an inpatient unit. And you know how when you go into an inpatient unit, um, uh, one of the staff give you a tour of the unit. So 
here are the rooms and here's the day room and you know here's the restraint room <laughs> okay we can get the lay of the land right and how how these are the rules and then after the official tour you know then then i would be sort of left in the day room and a and a person another a person uh, who was a patient would always kind of slide up on next to me and just give me the real deal what I really needed to know in just the most loving sort of matter of fact kind of way. So, so don't forget if you, if you want your meal to come up hot, here's what you need to know about that. And if you want um, to get your clothes cleaned, don't use that one, use this one over here. Cause that one's not working. It was just this totally reaching across, right? Reach not, not reaching down to pull me up, but rather just reaching across. I see you, I recognize you. Um, here's the inside scoop that you need to know. And I think um, that's all about love freely given, love freely given. So in my opinion, peer support is a natural response <clears throat> to being in a situation, a shared situation together. Um, and that it's a response that comes from a place of compassion. And it's freely given. I don't charge for it. I don't write clinical notes about it. It's just free. Um, because, of course, the word compassion means to suffer with. I'm willing to be with you. Um, so in my opinion, unpaid peer support has always been happening um, and always will happen. <clears throat> it just is. <clears throat> it's what it means to be human. But I think also it's very important for peer supporters and our colleagues, non-peer colleagues um, at work to understand that organized peer support, like we, um, it also has a very long history. And so I want you to take a minute uh, to meet uh, John Thomas Percival. <laughs> um, so John Thomas Perci Percival um, was in the UK, in, uh, in England. And he um, was a military guy. His dad actually uh, had become prime minister at one time. And uh, he was around in 1803 to 1876. So a while, right? A while ago. And yet when he got out of the military, he was committed to an uh, insane asylum in England. Uh, and he was kept there for, he was actually put in two different ones and he had, was kept there uh, for uh, the better part of uh, three years from 1831 to 1834, he was in asylum. And his time in asylum also included eight months in restraints, not like, uh, unlike the ones you see here, this particular form of, of restraint. Um, and um, as you can imagine, it's hard to distinguish that from torture, right? <laughs> because it's, wow, can you imagine being there for, for um, eight months? In any case, um, eventually he was discharged. And when he got out uh, of the asylum, he published two books uh, describing uh, his passage through madness and the horrors of the treatment he received. So even then recovery was happening with or without support. <laughs> People were making their way back to the life that they wanted. Um, and uh, he has these two extraordinary um, books called Percival's Narrative. Um, and I want to read you this passage because I think as peer supporters, we can relate to this. He wrote, I reflected on how many were in the same predicament in the asylum as myself. And I said, who shall speak for them if I do not? Who shall plead for them if I remain silent? How can I betray them and myself too by subscribing to the subtle villainy, cruelty, and tyranny of the doctors of the asylum? And this sense of sheer outrage, right? Of subtle villainy, cruelty, tyranny, right? The outrage that comes from that, I think, defines part of what is very central to the role of peer support, right? That I believe, and one of the ways I think about things is I say that peer support happens at the intersection between love and outrage, right at that intersection, 
the love that Percival shows in this quote. How could I not re respond to their suffering, right? Love, and then the outrage. I'm not gonna betray them by not speaking of this villainy and tyranny when I get out. Love and outrage, it's at that intersection that peer support occurs. Um, and when he got out, John Percival in, um, began to organize what eventually he decided to call the Alleged Lunatics Friends Society. And the Alleged Lunatic uh, uh, Friends Society uh, was an organization of about 60 uh, peers. All of them were alleged lunatics <laughs> and their allies. And um, this society operated um, from 1845 to 1863. And it did two types of work. On the one hand, it provided support um, and aid, tangible aid, practical aid to inmates in asylum. So it brought clean clothing and it uh, helped people smuggle letters because at the time you couldn't send the letter from inside the asylum. So they would help patients get writing utensils and, and to get things out of the asylum, um, help people advocate. But there was a second function too, and this was uh, systems and legislative advocacy. Uh, so they were, they were going to parliament, they were providing public lectures, they were exposing the abuses of the asylum system. Um, and, and here's an actual poster that uh, you know, uh, remains from, from those days. Uh, and, and I think it's extraordinary to think about that organized peer support goes back at least uh, to here. So, so my point here in sharing our history uh, with those of you and, and um, is, is that organized peer support has its roots in a commitment to bringing about change in behavioral health treatment. It has, a, our, our, our profession has its roots in making a more just and a more inclusive and a more tolerant society for those who've been diagnosed and then supporting people through the challenges that they are experiencing. Now, the reason this is important to grab this history and, and own it is that I think um, this understanding, uh, uh, there's a very widespread misconception about where the peer support movement comes from, right? Um, there's the idea that modern peer support, the kind we do today actually comes from uh, self-help groups um, around medical conditions, things like cancer support groups, uh, multiple sclerosis um, support group, Parkinson's uh, support groups, and even uh, the incredibly important 12-step uh, traditions, which are, um, uh, are um, support uh, groups as well. Um, and yet the truth is, is that peer support in its modern sense does not come from the self-help movement per se. Modern peer support actually has its roots and finds its inspiration historically in the women's movement, in the disability rights movement, in the civil rights movement, and in the peace movement, to name a few. So if we look um, in more recent history, we, I mean, we could start way back with Percival, but if we look in more modern times, what, what we find are our, our organizations have included uh, NARPA, which is the National Association for Rights Protection and Advocacy, which is still there. Um, the Icarus Project, Mind Freedom International, and in more recent times, the Hearing Voices Network, which is an international network of voice hearers. Um, it involves protest. It involves calling out the system for some of the injustices, particularly issues like forced drugging, the way we treat homelessness um, and, and people without homes, and, and et cetera. And so um, our movement really um, has its roots in trying to change the injustices that occur in mental health system, even up through this day. But then something very interesting began to happen. Um, once peer support began to transition from being voluntary and unpaid to being paid positions, um, largely funded by the government, we began to see a big change starting to happen. 
So I want to acknowledge my friend who uh, passed last autumn, uh, Darby Penny, for this slide. She's a founder of the modern peer movement and a great champion. Uh, she uh, uh, made this slide and I appropriated it with credit. Um, so anyway, I, th I think it does a good job of capturing um, this transition from love freely given to paid and professional peer support. And I don't have time to cover the whole uh, spectrum, but what I want you to notice with me is that in 1986, as you can see on the slide, the first paid positions explicitly carved out for people who had, who had used mental health services was in Colorado. And the positions were called consumer case manager aides, right? Aides, junior, junior case managers. And the purpose of these positions, and now I'll quote uh, the job description, was to train and employ persons with chronic mental illnesses as providers of case management services to other chronically mentally ill clients in the public mental health system. So basically, the peers were hired to fulfill responsibilities that were at a lower rate of pay than were usually, um, these responsibilities had usually been um, uh, handled by uh, traditional case managers. And I think that this, uh, eventually, this, this uh, impetus continued to some extent all the way up through Georgia um, and Larry Fricks getting the Medicaid waiver um, so that we could have Medicaid reimbursable services by peer staff and the peer certification um, process. And I think that this origin really, and this idea that somehow peer support only came out of the self-help movement and, for, and forgetting about or not even knowing about our roots in systems advocacy and in change this created a real deep confusion in our field about what our role is. And I think this, this confusion is still prevalent, um, that peer specialists are often expected to work as junior um, social workers, as junior case management, case managers. Um, but in so doing, we end up losing what makes us uh, really uh, unique in, in terms of our contribution to the, to the team. So I'll say clearly, and this is my main message today, is that peer specialists are not clinical staff. And even though we can work as a member of a clinical team, peer specialists are not clinical. And because the dominant culture of clinical teams is clinical, <laughs> there's tremendous pressure for peers to drift and to assimilate. Uh, into this dominant clinical or dominant rehabilitation culture of traditional mental health programs. So when I say that uh, peer specialists are not clinical, I mean that peer specialists do not use clinical language. We don't do that. So we don't use words like decompensate and so-and-so is returned to baseline and Joe lacks insight. We do not assess our peers. We do not perform assessments. That's a clinical function. Um, we do not encourage or discourage compliance with treatment. Right? And we do not attribute motive to peers. So we would never say uh, that, that uh, Mary is attention seeking or that uh, Joe is sabotaging his job placement. That's applying a kind of motive to what our peer is up to. But even though I can clearly state that these are things that we do not do, it is very easy to subtly and slowly drift into clinical culture and away from the peer role. And part of this um, is feeling uh, the pressure of the dominant clinical culture. That's the way people on the team talk. That's the way people on the team uh, formulate what issues are all about. And when we're present to that day in and day out, right, we begin to adopt or assimilate into that dominant culture. And that of course leads to drift. So drift from the role of peer specialists, um, the truth is, is that when we begin speaking and acting like clinicians, the whole team 
loses out on what makes us really unique. Um, we lose our unique identity um, and we lose our unduplicated contribution to the team. Another way to say that is the team needs us. The team needs the peer perspective. And if we're talking like and acting like clinicians, then the team is just getting clinical perspectives. They need us. The team needs peer specialists. So, you know, preparing for this talk, I, I, I thought a lot about it. What is the unique contribution that peer specialists bring to a clinical team? I mean, there are PhDs and MDs and MSWs and all of these very high ranking degrees, you know, and well-trained professionals with a lot of schooling. What is it that a peer specialist brings to that mix that is gonna be actually helpful, right? So the way I answered that is that the unique contribution of peer specialists on clinical teams, okay, is to help deepen the clinical case study into a story of the struggling and resilient human being that has come for help. Peer specialists help teams understand how this individual makes sense of their experiences. As peer specialists, we might know what the word baseline means. We might know what the word paranoia means, but we bracket those clinical constructs, those clinical words, those cl that clinical way of seeing stuff. When I say bracket, I mean, we put it up on a shelf. We don't, we don't say, hey, that's really stupid. It's, there's no such thing as paranoia. We don't go there. It's not a competition. We have a different way of seeing. We have a different way of speaking. We bracket the clinical worldview, and we're seeking to connect with the individual as an individual, right? We're seeking to understand how does this unique individual who's right in front of me today, how do they understand what's happening in their lives? And then how can I take what I learn about how this individual understands what's going on and present that faithfully uh, to the team? So as peer specialists, what we're doing that makes us very unique is that we are trying to understand how does this individual I'm working with make meaning of their life and of their current situation. We seek to understand their experience, right? So let's just take, I got three quick examples for you. One is, let's say that a, um, a person uh, is letting the team know, including the peer specialist who's part of the team, that uh, my, my communications are being monitored, all of my text messages are being monitored by forces we can't go up, on and on, right? So um, in that, the clinical framework might be that that is paranoia and it is symptomatic of a particular condition. That's the clinical view, right? That is not the view we take. We take that idea of paranoia and we put it on a shelf, we bracket it. And instead um, we might say, because we're open in a new way to this person, hey, where could we meet where you would feel safe? Where, where would a, a safe place be to meet? Maybe we leave our cell phones at home. Maybe we leave them you know, under the table when we meet, just, and in doing that, what we can do is create connection. Another example, um, the team might think that someone is having auditory hallucinations, which again might be symptomatic of, let's say, a psychosis. Um, and that the person is not using their medications, obviously, because the auditory hallucinations continue to be tough. Well, as peer specialists, we're going to take that construct of auditory hallucinations and we're going to bracket it. We're going to put it on a shelf. It doesn't mean it's a stupid idea. Clinicians do a lot of really smart and really good things often, right? But we just don't have to view the individual through that lens. We have a different lens. That's more human um, lens. And so um, in talking, um, 
I might say to that uh, peer, oh, gee, um, t t talk to, uh, you know, what, what, what do you experience? I had voices once too, right? Well, it might, and then, and then it could turn out that, that the person says, I really like some of my voices. Some of them are awful, but some of them are really great. And they tell me I'm special and they tell me I'm really unique and I'm not taking the damn meds because I don't want to get rid of them. Wow. The peer specialist can bring that unique, unduplicated perspective to the team to deepen that clinical case study, auditory hallucinations, symptomatic of psychosis. No, deepen. That's what we do, right? We deepen it into a human experience. And this is invaluable. Sometimes the insights that are gleaned from the simply human perspective really enrich the team's understanding of what's going on and help us provide much, much better care, right? And when we drift and we start using words like auditory hallucinations and paranoia and other, and, and thinking that way especially, then the team has lost what it is we do. Okay. So I think that um, now what I wanna do is cover four role responsibilities. Um, that help us remain true to our role, right? So on the one hand, I've said some of the things peer specialists don't do, but what like do we do, <laughs> right? Okay, so let's look at some of our role responsibilities. I'm gonna look at relationship building. I'm gonna look at influencing team culture. I'm gonna look at the role of embracing creative narratives. And I'm gonna look, at the role of having a voice and a choice and finding the treatment that's right for me. So I want to give a shout out to my friends and colleagues, Sasha altman Debru and Abby Duke. Um, and for many years, we've been collaborating on articulating these roles. So role responsibility number one. I do think there are other roles, by the way, but these are the four core that I have time to cover today. Relationship building. Peer specialists develop relationships with program participants that include connecting around their shared mental health experiences and other aspects of their lives. These relationships should be reciprocal in nature where both the peer specialist and the participant are encouraged to make contributions. So to summarize this wordy slide, Really what it says is it's a two-way relationship. It's different than a relationship with a therapist, which is more of a one-way relationship. This is a two-way relationship. And reciprocity means that it's a relationship that's marked by a kind of give, um, give and take. In traditional clinical roles, they, we would not expect a robust give and take about whether or not you like to watch Game of Thrones with my psychiatrist. <laughs> but that kind of give and take might actually be a wonderful conversation if I'm with a peer specialist. So it's about um, mental health services and traditional clinical roles. There tends to be the giver and the taker. There tends to be the one who's the fixer and the one who's going to get fixed, right? But in our relationships as peers, it's not, it's a give and take. And part of what's beautiful about this mutuality is yes, we share lived experience and, but that um, sometimes our peer might help us. The peer might say, ah, oh, you look really tired. Have you been sleeping? And as a peer specialist, I would be within the role of peer to say, no, I've been a worry wart lately and I just am not getting good sleep. And then the peer might say, oh, gosh, that's tough. You know what I do to get good sleep? No, what do you do? You know, I turn off my electronics an hour before I'm going to try to get some shut eye. Oh, I didn't know that. That I'm going to try that. That's what the peer specialist says. In other words, I've just received. Now, this is an extraordinary healing moment, right? A teachable moment because so often, you know, they used to call us mental health consumers. Like all, all that would conjure up for me is a big orifice. <laughs> We're just consuming, consuming, consuming. But the truth is we can give. So for us to, as peer specialists to give a peer an opportunity to give to us can be profoundly healing. 
right? And develop real mutuality and reciprocity in the relationship. So now, if this is our role responsibility to build these two-way relationships, right? What happens when we drift? What, what, are, what are some of the typical ways I see people drifting? And, and one of the ways I see um, drift is, is, is what I call drift into paid friendship. So we drift from the role of peer specialist into being a paid friend. So let's say that there's a peer specialist who was sad. I'm sorry, there's a peer specialist who's sitting uh, with a peer who was very sad about the anniversary of the death of her best friend. And later when she was feeling a bit better, this young woman uh, says to the peer specialist, thanks, I feel better. At least I still have you for a friend to which the peer specialist responds, I'll be here in friendship for you. I know this is a tough time of year for you. So what is happening here is that the peer specialist is drifting. She's not being clear with, the, um, uh, with her peer that in fact, she is not this peer's friend, you know, and um, she's drifting. And so warm and caring, yes, but not friends, why? Friends do not get paid to be with friends. Number one, why aren't we friends? Number two, friends don't write Medicaid billable notes with friends or about friends and peer specialist relationships with peers is a bridge that arcs to the real world of friendship and community. Now this is really important, really important. Okay, we don't get paid when we're with our friends. That's why we're not friends. <laughs> and it can, we can be friendly, warm, compassionate, uplifting, you know, positive regard, all of it. Yes. But to be able to say that I'm not your friend, your friends are out there waiting to be discovered is a very powerful act of hope that we can make with people. It's saying, look, I get paid. This is my work. I really care about you. I really like you. This, we're doing great stuff together. You know, another day, another time. We might be friends, but not today because I'm at work, right? Okay. But there's a whole world of friends out there waiting for, for you um, to discover them. And this is a very important role that peer specialists play. We are, we, our relationship with the individual is like a bridger. We bridge to the community where real friendship, where, see in the olden days when people were institutionalized, the only people that were ever with you were people who were paid to be with you. And the whole disability rights movement rose up and said, no, no, we don't want paid friends. We want real friends, thank you, right? So that's part of our history is owning that reality from the disability rights movement and saying our relationship is a bridge that arcs to the community where real friends await you, not paid staff. Another common form of drift from this role of responsibility, okay, um, is, uh, let's say in, in, this, in this example, well, well, well the drift, is falling into the helper role and prescribing help for the individual. Okay, prescribing help, falling into the, the helper role. And the person we're working with is the helpee, right? And that's not that reciprocal mutual back and forth that we talked about earlier. So here's an example. Um, a peer is feeling pretty bad because they flunked a test. And the peer specialist tries to fix that in a way uh, by saying, you know, don't, don't, don't worry, um, well, I'll, 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 uh, I'll study with you. Kind of jumps right in and prescribes the help. Um, but the bottom line is that this is drift from the role of peer because peer specialists are never fixers because our peers don't need fixing, right? Our peers aren't broken, they don't need to be fixed, right? 
So really what can be really helpful is that the individual um, could say, what might help right now? Or in what way could I support you right now? Or um, do you even need support right now around this? Or even more powerful is to say, yeah, I flunked a few big ones in my life too. So I get it, I get it, um, wanna talk. Um, and one of the things I think we can do to help with this form of drift is to ask ourselves when working, am I keeping the focus on learning together? rather than assessing and prescribing help. And this is a tricky one. And sometimes we're gonna fall into that drift. And this question helps us self-correct, okay? So when I'm working, am I keeping the focus on learning together? That's so different than prescribing help. Okay. Um, role responsibility number two, influencing team culture. What do peer specialists do on clinical teams? We positively influence the team culture. And we do that by emphasizing the perspectives and experiences of participants, highlighting a holistic view of each individual and making space for the individual's viewpoint in the midst of that clinical um, formulation of what's going on. Peer specialists along with other team members encourage the use of recovery oriented language um, and um, that person first kind of language. All right, so what do I mean by this? And I think we're all pretty familiar with this, but just to say, I've always got to be um, on top of this, you know, using person first language, understanding the ways in which perhaps I was colonized by my, my, my thinking and by clinical constructs, right? Schizophrenia, bipolar, borderline, as opposed to person first, the person's been diagnosed with. Low functioning is a classic. Um, I don't know about you, but I know in my early recovery, I didn't wanna hang around with low functioning people, quote unquote. Where did I get that from? Wow, that was, that's scary, right? So many of us have that, right? And I'll be honest with you, it took me a while to undo that form of prejudice, right? And I began to learn that, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Uh, I like to think of myself as a high functioning now. <laughs> Where's that at? You put me in the right situation, right? And I am not a high functioning gal, <laughs> right? So it all depends, right? And so I think it's much more helpful to say, hey, I haven't discovered Jim's gifts. You know, I haven't discovered his gifts yet, but I know they're there. I just haven't seen them in the right environment. I'm really bothered by the term decompensating. It sounds too much like decomposing. Um, and so um, rather let's be descriptive and say, you know, she's having a hard time and skipping work perhaps. Be, be descriptive. Non-compliant is a classic. She's not mo feeling motivated to take the meds. Would be more person-centered. There's a frequent flyer. Nope, we're not gonna go there. Feels safer in the hospital and keeps coming back. Manipulative, that's a classic. I think it's much more human to reframe that as this person's desperate or very good at getting what they need. This person's unmotivated. Well, they seem to wanna to play video games rather than go to school these days. And it's not that they're unmotivated, they're motivated in ways that you don't appreciate. <laughs> I remember for years, my motivation was sitting in a chair, smoking cigarettes and watching the world go by as I was uh, over-medicated on uh, haloperidol. Um, and I was motivated to smoke cigarettes and I had plenty of motivation. <laughs> it just was not in the ways that were particularly health healthy. Uh, return to baseline, um, that's a tricky one. And I just like to say, well, she's returned and she's feeling like, feeling back to feeling like herself again. So using this person first language and not buying into the clinical language is one, one way we help to influence team culture. Another is that we are present to and aware of um, peer run alternatives to mental health systems and ways that, that the, these groups and support groups, et cetera, can be there for people. And so I've put up a couple, um, Depression Bipolar Support Alliance is an awesome self-help kind of um, group, DBSA. Um, the Hearing Voices Network, I've already mentioned, but there are chapters all over um, the United States and are hugely empowering and helpful. 
And then I did a plug for my own stuff, uh, which includes my recovery academy and my recovery library. Great ways that uh, that uh, folks can um, learn more and uh, get different perspectives and believe in this recovery process. Okay. What's the third way we can influence culture? And I think that's by humanizing and complicating the clinical story. So sometimes um, people get hurt in mental health systems. Uh, an example might be a person um, being uh, having to go through a, a takedown in a psychiatric hospital and be put in restraints. That can be profoundly traumatizing. Uh, many of us would argue that's not treatment, it's torture. Um, and so when a peer comes out of the hospital and try to talk to the psychiatrist about that or try to talk to their therapist about that, honestly, very often professionals will hedge around that and won't feel really comfortable getting into the details with anybody or letting especially that person um, rage and, and have a very real sense of outrage about that experience. That's a place where we can become incredibly helpful to peers because probably we've been through something similar ourselves, right? So we can validate peers' dignity or, and experiences of indignity. The other thing we can do that's super important um, within a clinical culture, we don't always hear about rights. And yes, we do all have rights. And so in my opinion, peer specialists should be well-versed in our state statutes, what the law says about everything from um, forced medication to involuntary commitment to my rights to, to care and my rights to treatment, okay? And so um, one basic tool, if you're interested in getting started with this role of responsibility, the Psychiatric Advance Directive, and there's a free app online, it's called My Mental Health Crisis Plan. This is um, offered through the um, SMI Advisor, a federally funded SAMHSA uh, uh, program that's operating now, and it's called My MHCP, My Mental Health Crisis Plan, and the core of it is a psychiatric advance of directive. It's a great way to learn how to use them, do one for ourselves, and then also tell our peers about it. And I, you know, chances are that other members of the clinical team will not be well versed in this psychiatric advance directive opportunity. So it's a great way to get started with this role responsibility. Next one, responsibility three, embracing creative complex narratives. So peer specialists explore and discuss multiple frameworks for understanding life experiences, including personal understandings of what clinicians call mental illness. The peer specialist is encouraged to embrace participants' diverse narratives in order to create space for complex personal stories of recovery and resilience. So let's take it down from those lofty heights right into an example. So this peer specialist was uh, working on a clinical team and was at the team's clinical meeting um, where a new program participant was being discussed. And the peer specialist said, I think Zach is pretty low functioning and I should begin outreaching to his sister who can supervise his med compliance. So um, the peer specialist has clearly drifted, clearly drifted. Um, and is uh, talking, of course, with clinical um, language, um, but more importantly, has really adopted um, the um, whole clinical worldview here and strayed from uh, the peer's prerogative, the peer specialist prerogative, which is to tell a more complex <coughs> story. Um, and um, so, what I mean by a more complex creative narrative, rather than, oh, Joe is non-compliant, is that perhaps he might say, well, some of the voices Zach hears are really wonderful. They comfort him and help him believe he's really special. He doesn't take the meds because they interfere with those voices. He doesn't want to get rid of them. That's that idea of deepening into a more complex narrative. It's, in many ways, the clinical narrative tends to be a little on the simplistic side, meaning um, this is a symptom, medications take away symptoms, treatment takes away symptoms. And we're saying, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. What you're calling a symptom is also something else. 
right? And that something else is this experience, which some of the time builds up Zach and makes him feel good about himself. Oh, that's really good information. Let's look at another one. Keanu told his peer supporter, stories about shamans go way back in my culture. Maybe my visions and voices mean I'm becoming a shaman. Maybe I don't have psychosis. And in this case, the peer specialist drifts and says, man, your doc says you have psychosis. It's not your fault. In order to recover, you have to accept your illness. That's the first step, right? So what's happening here is that the peer supporter is leaving Keanu's more complex understanding, developing understanding of what is happening for him, right? He's leaving that and saying, no, no, this is the more correct understanding of what's really going on, right? And essentially what's happening here is the peer specialist is silencing um, Keanu, right? But a more complex narrative might be, and it more in the role of the peer specialist. That's interesting, Keanu. I don't know that much about shamans. Maybe you can teach me. But I remember thinking I was having a spiritual emergence, like I was awakening into a new consciousness. It was beautiful. So this is a very powerful example of, again, deepening that clinical narrative and reminding the team that individuals also have their own understanding and meaning about what's going on here. Frankly, two things can be true at the same time. This person may be diagnosed with psychosis and may be having a spiritual emergence, right? They're not mutually exclusive categories. And that's what I'm saying that we do that is so important to the clinical team, right? Is we deepen the uh, narrative uh, and the clinical formulation so that it becomes a human story, which is far more complex. Another classic one that occurs in this way is when a, when a peer shares with a peer specialist a trauma history. And we wanna believe that it's genetic, that this depression that the peer is um, struggling with is genetic because it's been in the family for you know, 50 years. And now you've got it. That could be a clinical formulation, right? But it's skipping over the fact that, no, 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 I was sexually abused since infancy. Oh. Well, that certainly deepens and complexifies the narrative, right? And the good news is I think our voice in this way has really begun to make a difference because um, we are um, now seeing more and more assessment for trauma going on. Um, so important role responsibilities. To summarize this particular role responsibility, um, what peer supporters do do in terms of helping to create and support complex narratives is we, we, we help people, we support people, we listen to people as they're beginning to grapple with making personal meaning of their experience, right? We also are willing, even though we might not even not know a lot about it, to embrace someone's complex narrative and want to know more so that we can reliably represent it uh, when we're with the team. So common ones, as I mentioned, trauma, spiritual immune, uh, emergence, um, or just a variation of human experience. And as I've mentioned, these really do, um, these alternative stories and meanings really help to deepen what's going on clinically and are of great help uh, to the team. And now I wanna just talk about the fourth uh, role responsibility. Um, and then we're going to get uh, things opened up and, and have some conversation because I see sort of the chat being active. Okay. The fourth role responsibility is advocacy and empowerment. And the way I see this is peer specialists support people in having a voice and a choice in all aspects of healthcare, including decisions about. Uh, medications. Now, um, I know that there is tremendous controversy um, in um, our field as peer specialists 
where in some agencies, peer specialists are told they are not allowed to talk to staff, uh, to, to talk to individuals about meds. And in other uh, teams and uh, programs, peer specialists are asked to um, help the person become compliant with their medication and to gain insight into the fact that they're ill. So we're kind of all over the place with peer specialists. And I think in many ways, there's a fear or a worry or a concern on clinical teams that if peer specialists talk about medications, they'll tell people to go off, right? Um, so what is the role of peer specialists um, uh, around meds, but also around other treatment um, decisions about whether or not to do cognitive behavioral therapy or family therapy or other tr uh, treatment modalities, right? So um, I wanna focus a little bit just here at the very end, just on the medication part, because I think it's probably the most controversial of all, and it's where a lot of my recent work is very much focused, right? I believe peer specialists have a vital and critical role to play around uh, psych meds, and that the role of peer supporters is to help people prepare to participate and having a voice and a choice in all decisions about psychiatric meds. Peer supporters assist individuals in becoming empowered self-advocates when it comes to meds and other treatment approaches. We are not doctors and that's true, but we have the lived experience of working with doctors and we understand the importance of speaking up and being a self-advocate. So in my most recent work, I've been grappling in a big way with this topic, trying to invent a whole new way of thinking about medications and recovery and shared decision-making and how to work um, with clinical staff as well as peer specialists around medications. And I call my new approach medication empowerment. And this is an unabashed advertisement. If you get a minute, check out my website at patdegan.com and check out what's happening there because I offer an entire online approach and, and course for peer specialists, for psychiatrists, for individuals, for families on this new approach to thinking about meds. I like this idea of medication empowerment because it breaks down to it's about me. And that when we meet with mental health um, um, psychiatric care providers, there are two experts in the room. I'm an expert in my body. I'm an expert in what matters to me. I'm an expert in how the side effects feels and how intense it is. And the only way we can find the treatment that is right for us is to work in collaboration with the professional who's also an expert. Uh, healthcare is co-created. So let me give you a feel for, for what uh, this curricula is like, medication empowerment. In this short animated video, you'll get to see a, 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 um, uh, a, a way that peer specialists can use what I call power statements to help individuals prepare to tell their psychiatrist how I want medicine to help me. Can you imagine how fundamental that is? Don't you think that's like the most important thing? I do. How do I want medicine? My mother wants medicine to help me calm down. My husband wants medicine to help even out my mood. But how do I want medicine to help me? We have to find that out. Our lives literally depend on it, right? I don't want to get so over medicated because of, of symptom suppression. I want meds to work to help me get that life that I want for myself. So anyway, let's take a look at what I'm up to here. <laughs> it's pretty cool. My goal for treatment. Any of us find that having a clear goal for medication treatment is helpful? Here's what I mean. Imagine me and my doctor are in a rowboat that has two sets of oars. My doctor is rowing one way, I am rowing in a different direction. Let's say I am rowing toward
toward my goal of completing college. My doctor is rowing toward the goal of reducing my symptoms with meds, but the meds are making me so sleepy, I can't wake up on time for school. Clearly, when my doctor and I are rowing in different directions toward different goals, we won't get very far. The solution is obvious. We need to start rowing in the same direction. And for that to happen, we have to agree on where we are heading. Because it's our life and our treatment, it's best to share our goals with the doctor. A two-step power statement can help us tell the doctor about our goal for medication treatment. I want to work together to find a medicine that will help me sleep better so that I can wake up on time for work. Here's another example of a power statement. I want to work together to find a medicine that will help me manage my temper so that I can get along better with my family. Of course, you can fill in your own power statement with your goals. It's best to write down a power statement and give it to the doctor. If goals change or if we have new goals, it's important to update our power statement. Even if we've been working with the doctor for a long time, it's still a good idea to create a power statement so the doctor can get on board with where we want to go. And then after learning about power statements, you and the individual you might be working with could actually create a power statement right there together. So for instance, um, I want to work together to find a medicine that will make the voices quiet down so that I can pay attention to making the pizzas at work. So how do I know if treatment is helping me? How will me and my doctor know? We'll know if I'm able to pay attention to making the pizzas at work. You see, because what can happen is if all I say is, I need to make the, I want the voices to quiet down, then I might end up with so much medication that yeah, I'm not hearing voices, but I can't stay awake, <laughs> right? And that's unacceptable. We want to make the voices quiet down so I can pay attention to making the pizzas at work. Oh, okay, that's the measure of how we know treatment's helpful. And who are you gonna share your power statement with? And what are your next steps? I'll take a picture of this and have it on my phone show it at my next appointment. So that's what I'm up to these days. And I'm very excited about it if you can't tell. Uh, I think it could change, change things in the positive for so many of our peers if we help them become empowered to have a voice and a choice in their care. In summary, peer specialists on clinical teams, what do we do? We deepen the clinical formulation by representing the individual's understanding of what's happening by influencing the team culture to be more recovery oriented and person centered. We advocate and support self empowerment so the individual's voice and choice is understood by the team. And we pull back the lens to include legal issues, human rights, community, and cultural perspectives on the clinical team. So, on that note, I'm going to stop and we're going to be able to have uh, Maria open this up. Yeah. Great. Well, I have to say that Chad has been very active, mostly um, lots of kudos, <laughs> just feedback. And I think the last one I read was, you know, literally warm fuzzies that people are feeling about this talk today. And I think a lot of validation of people's experiences, including wanting to potentially get back to this role in the way that you've described it and acknowledging some drift. And also I think the system kind of promoting some of that drift and, and also confusion, like you said, on kind of either end of the spectrum. You mentioned the one around medications, either not talking about medications at all or having to like actually go out or do medication management on the other end of the spectrum. Um, we did have a comment in the question and answer box about documentation, in particular, you know, the fact that, you know, how can we remain non-clinical in documentation when intervention 
terminology is required to be fillable. So if you could say something about that. Yes, um, I do think it's uh, very possible to do that, but it's not easy. And that for those of us, again, I'm not talking about peer specialists working in um, peer run organizations. I'm talking about peer specialists who are integrated and working as colleagues on clinical teams or in traditional mental health programs. And I think that uh, we need the support of our supervisors in knowing that inviting our peer to help co-create and co-write um, uh, clinical uh, notes or, or, or notes that document our meeting in order to be billable um, is happening. And that our peers are smart and they will understand that uh, I need to use this word and I can't use that word. I mean, they get it, right? But what's really important is knowing that they have an ally and someone who's working with them to represent with true fidelity their experience of, of what's going on. Um, and I think there's nothing, I don't know if you've, uh, the person who's asking the question or others of you who are out there have ever, ever gone and gotten your, your uh, previous, I don't know, inpatient admission notes and stuff, but the the errors, and I mean, just out and out, I never did that, or that never happened, or, you know, it's really remarkable, and it becomes like this clinical folklore, right, where it just gets passed down from record to record to clinician to clinician, and, you know, I just think that being very solicitous and concerned with making sure that we're representing the peer's experience in the note while being honest about that word doesn't work, <laughs> you know, really, really is the ticket there. And it is harder and it does take a, a longer uh, amount of time. So we need support from our, our uh, supervisors for that. Well, with that, actually, the next question is, what would be your advice for a peer to push back against a supervisor or an entire agency that continues to ask peers to take on clinical roles? What language or approach should be utilized? I know you're going to come to the next webinar, but. <laughs> I'll talk to them. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, I get it. I get it. And I think, you know, we all, I mean, I get it. It's just, it's very, very tough. And so there are efforts like MHTTC, which is a, this is a national webinar today, which is awesome. And it wasn't just for peer specialists. Supervisors were invited. And that's intentional. That's trying to say, hey, we got to make sure that peer supporters are getting the support they need to do what they do. Um, and uh, I just think, you know, with continuing to kind of chip away at it um, in, in an individual instance, get that supervisor to a conference, get them on a webinar, you know, whatever, whatever you can try to do. Um, and then I think just like any other job, sometimes if a place just is so, values are just so not consonant with mine, sometimes I have to leave. And I know that that can be a grueling choice when they're the only show in town and, uh, and I need the money. So um, the other strategy I think that's always important is re really try, I think twice about being an N of one, right? Just, just one of me. It's great to have a, 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 a smaller group of, or even larger group of people that are in the peer supporter role as well. So yeah, it's always difficult. And I have a whole other talk I do, and maybe someday we can do it, about how um, when we come into uh, a traditional workplace, a clinical environment or rehabilitation, there are ways in which our very presence causes a culture shift. And nobody likes culture shift. <laughs> it's uncomfortable. So uh, what reliably begins to happen is that the, 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 the clinical staff begins saying, gee, I was in therapy. Gee, I take Xanax. I wonder if I'm a peer. Um, and, and that is like, whoa, but I don't bring my personal life to work. But I was in counseling for a while. Does that make me appear special? And it be, it, all of these kind of seismic things. Be, and that has to be very carefully managed by supervisors. Or it can really get out of hand. And then we get into the whole aspect of microaggression and the peer practitioner, right? Which can really be ugly, right? Um, uh, and so, but that's a whole other course. <laughs> well, I think you, you said it well, though. I mean, it, it is... 
it's a tough position, but I think where people can really start to think about who could I get even this very talk, you know, and whose hands can I get this talk into? And, you know, for them to really see and kind of have the aha moment that even some of, you know, some folks who are doing this work are having right now about, oh, no wonder that didn't feel comfortable to me. Or, you know, again, I want to get back to what this role is, you know, what's really intended here and to, to spread the word on that. Um, and so thinking just who in your state, who in your agency, who needs to kind of see this important, clar huge clarification around the role is, is huge. We had somebody even reach out and say, could you, you know, can I connect our training director to you? And stuff like that, which I think is, you know, it's part of this for sure. Um, let's see, we've had several questions come up since you, we started opening up the Q&A. Um, Tiffany is asking, I also am curious what, your thoughts are on creating goals and objectives for service plans. Any thoughts on that? It probably relates to kind of the earlier question about documentation and knowing that, you know, these clinical terms kind of, you know, embedded, you know, what, how do we meet those requirements while also being true to this role and, and being person centered? Yeah. Well, I, I, for instance, I shared with you the little video on the power statement. And it's a very, very powerful way, a very effective way of helping people say how they want a particular treatment to help them. Um, and I think that that's a, a great, simple tool. And I believe I gave the power statement worksheet as a handout. And so we have, yes. um, we have about 80 mental health centers around the United States that use my software and everyone who uses my software is called Common Ground Software, and they and and peer specialists greet people coming into psych to, to the psychiatric clinic, and hey, let's prepare to participate to see the doctor. And they use the software, and one of the first things they do is they create the power statement, right? And then that goes right electronically right into the into the consult, um, so the doctor knows from the giddy up, oh, they want to make these pizzas. That's that's how we'll know treatment is effective. So I think that little little techniques like a power statement is a bit, and, and you, by the way, you have permission to use my, my worksheet um, with people right, right from the get-go and, and, and start helping people identify those goals. Um, you know, there's always bending and twisting. I mean, I live in the real world too, and you know, we gotta meet those requirements, but I think just giving the nod to people and letting them know, mm -hmm. you know, this is something that we're gonna do. And uh but you know, it's also about preparing for that meeting and, 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 and like, so the person has that conversation where they know that they're understood. I really think that that's, that's critical, that, they, that, that folks know, well, you really understand the life that I'm looking to get and how I want to get there. As much the process as well as the outcome. So not just that, whole, that document is, is the result, but it's, it's that, people really feeling engaged in that conversation about their lives, you know, within the context of treatment, but certainly like how, how are we going to help you, you know, have the life you want to have. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I think too, I mean, we can also put in kind of the follow-up around just person-centered treatment planning. There's so much work that's gone into that. And, you know, it's not just about, it's about the person's words and their goals, but it, it, it's everything that follows from that and through that you know, that, that takes it kind of to the next level. So it's kind of beyond the, the objectives written, you know, within that form um, and in the EHR. Um, we had a question uh, about whether you've been involved with family partner programs or peer specialists, um, peer supports with youth and or um, IDD, IDD services. And if so, any advice or insight in, in some of these other systems? We use the common ground software even with people with IDD um, yeah. in, in, in public services and stuff. No, no, I, I I don't have any like particular. I mean, I think that these the this bringing individual voice and choice to the center of the care team is a way to protect human dignity. It's the suppression of voice that violates dignity the suppression, and I don't care what label you carry, you know it, right? 
So promoting dignity, safeguarding human dignity, that's what the work is. I know that's our company's mission, my company's mission, is that that's, a, that's what we do. We create tools and technologies that protect voice and choice. And sometimes the protection is not because there are evil and cruel providers out there. It's, it's not so much about that, but just in the sheer volume and busyness and the pace at which the field is always moving and there's never enough time and there's never enough staff and it's always under fun. I mean, it just, it's easy to, to uh, make the mistakes, to take the shortcuts, just to, just to get done. And, and I think that, we can be thinking about, okay, what are some assistive technologies? What are some ways that we can assist amplifying the voice? You see, I think that, um, I think the, um, I, I, well, I, I think that says it. I, I just think it's about assist, it's, it's creating assistive technologies and tools that amplify voice and choice so that within the constraints of a very busy public sector, people have a chance of getting a word in edgewise. Did you know, this is really a true fact, um, that studies have been done um, in, in uh, healthcare that uh, when we go to see our, let's say primary care doctor, on average, um, Americans get 18 seconds uh, to respond when the doctor says, how are you doing? Before the physician interrupts and begins to interrogate, question and, and get to their agenda because they've got to, you got 18 seconds, guys. And then you add to that, oh, yeah, and I'm hearing voices. <laughs> oh, boy. Or I'm so anxious, I've got the shakes. Whoa, 18 seconds. What are you going to do? You got to prepare. We have to prepare to participate. Our lives depend on it. <laughs> and we're working. Absolutely. That's 18 seconds. Wow. 18 seconds. That's no time at all. <laughs> around some of these complexities for sure. Yeah. We've got a lot of questions that I think you might be able to address kind of um, in just telling us a little bit about maybe your upcoming webinar. Lots of folks just really wanting to educate their agencies, supervisors. Again, this just seems to be kind of a recurring theme, a one hour in length, you know, training um, around, you know, to administration or upper management. Could you tell us a little bit about your webinar that's coming up um, in about a month on June 7th? Um, that might help to set the stage for, you know, hopefully you know, folks spreading the word to the people that need to be showing up to that webinar as well. So this web webinar was really a deeper dive into the role responsibilities and the uh, instances of drift and the authentic roots of peer support. That's really what we went deep into. On the second webinar, um, I will reference those, touch on them, say a bit about those things. But my focus in the next webinar is, okay, supervisors of peer uh, specialists and peer supporters, how do we safeguard the role? And that's, that's the difference between these two, two things. To safeguard the role. And so having, Having folks who are not here but are attending that one be good for us to kind of spread the word about this one for them to potentially watch on our, you know, from our website kind of before they jump into the second one, would you say? Yeah, yeah. I think it'll be a richer experience if you have some exposure to this for sure. Right. But um, yeah. Okay. We got um, let's see, we've only got a couple of minutes here, but I just really quickly wanted to ask about uh boy, there's a few here. Let me just see. Any uh, recommendations on boundaries um, that you people should be making for a peer support specialist joining a clinical team from which treatment? From which what? From which they already received treatment, so they've worked. Oh boy! <laughs> Do you want to say a little something about that? Yeah, I don't claim any real expertise there, but I would say um, you know um, you know that our that that a role is not an identity. Uh, any more than being a psychiatrist is an identity or, or being a service user and or a new worker. Personally, on a peer-to-peer -peer level, I really encourage my peers to seek elsewhere. Now, that said, some organizations are very large. And if I'm working way over here on an inpatient unit and, you know, the positions in the outpatient clinic, you know, 
I get that that can lead to some distance that allows for a, a greater level of comfort. But to be a previous service user, I see that sometimes on the um, first episode teams where someone who yeah. had been in services goes back and be the peer special. Uh, that's very difficult. I advise folks now, but people do what they do. And some people are, have done it successfully. Some teams have done it successfully. Yeah, we have seen have. some uh, teams say, well, they thought that was the requirement. You kind of work with, you know, graduates of the program to then come back in as a peer versus not thinking kind of more broadly about recruitment from other places. So it's, yeah. um, it's it, that is a really challenging situation, I think. I agree. Right. Um, well, we are at the end of our time with you, and we so appreciate you taking the time to, to share this with us. Incredible. Again, I, I say this, I feel like every time you talk, I've seen you present so much, Pat, and sometimes even the same um, general topic, and it's always new to me and always just so inspiring, and I just want to share with everyone. So thank you so much for sharing yeah. tons of comments um, in the chat, just saying, very similar things, especially for people who are doing this work live. So we really appreciate that. Again, we encourage everyone to join us again in about a month on June 7th, 10 to 11.30 Pacific. And um, if you're already signed up for this, you'll get more information about um, signing up for that one as well. And certainly again, spread the word to supervisors and management as I know many of you wanted to do uh, from this talk and going forward. Thanks again and everyone be well. Be safe and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you guys.